Now we summarize our findings by formulating the principal component analysis or PCA algorithm. First, we start from our data matrix X and we compute the covariance matrix X transposed X. And in this case, we also divide it by T minus one, so the number of data points minus one. The minus one is just because we have lost a degree of freedom during computing the mean, but that's not so important. Mainly, we want to normalize the covariance matrix here to the number of data points. I haven't done this in the equations before, but right now it can be quite important to do that because we want to restrict the, the, the magnitude of the elements in the covariance matrix. So we don't want to go to very large numbers in the covariance matrix here. Other than that, this scaling factor, one over the number of time steps, will not change the result. So we can as well uh, do the calculation with, without the scaling factor and we will get the same eigenvectors. Having the covariance matrix of the data, we solve the eigenvalue problem. So we compute the eigenvectors of C0. We additionally normalize the eigenvectors, Wi. Many implementations of eigenvalue solvers will already give us normalized eigenvectors, but some don't, so we just do this subsequently to computing the eigenvalue decomposition to be sure that our eigenvectors are normed. Then we select the m largest eigenvalues and their corresponding eigenvectors, and this defines the m principal components. And then we assemble the corresponding projection matrix, Wm, so that is the matrix which contains the first m eigenvectors or the m eigenvectors with the largest eigenvalues and we use this matrix to project our data matrix onto our subspace ym. So this is our dimension reduced data. This is the principal component analysis and we have defined it or we have derived it by asking for the directions which maximize the variance of the projected data but we will see that it has a number of other interesting properties. First of all, principal component vectors are orthogonal. This is simply a result of the eigenvalue decomposition. So W is an eigenvector matrix and W transpose W, that is computing all the scalar products between all pairs of eigenvectors, that gives us an identity matrix. So in other words, all pairs of different eigenvectors are orthogonal to each other. Secondly, now we need to be a little bit more precise with our words here. When we use the word principal component, what we mean is the component of the data into the corresponding principal component vectors. So the first principal component of the data set is what we get when we project the data set onto the eigenvector with the largest eigenvalue. So after projecting our data onto the W matrix, we have selected M principal components and they are in our matrix Y. Now we have the principal components are uncorrelated. Correlation is just a normalized version of covariance. So what we need to show is that the covariance matrix of the principal components is a diagonal matrix so that there is no covariance between pairwise different principal components. So let's do that. The covariance matrix of the principal components is y transposed y, normalized by the number of time steps. We write out what y is, so y is just the projection of the data x using the projection matrix w, so xw. y transposed y is therefore w transposed x transposed xw. Now we notice that x transposed x here is just a covariance matrix of the original data and we have given another expression of x transposed x in terms of its eigenvalue decomposition in the slide before. In the slide before we have done the eigenvalue decomposition for individual eigenvalues and eigenvectors but we can do it for all the eigenvectors and eigenvalues and therefore write x transposed x in terms of its Diag diagonalized form. So that is just eigenvector matrix W times eigenvalue matrix sigma square times eigenvector matrix transposed. So that is the diagonalized form of X transposed X and we have replaced it here in the middle. 
Now we notice we have two times W transpose W, that is the pairwise scalar product of eigenvectors. And we have noticed that this is actually the identity matrix in step one. So we can get rid of these W transpose Ws and all we are left with is the eigenvalue matrix squared. Or to be clear, sigma squared is the diagonal matrix with the eigenvalues on the diagonal. The reason why we call it sigma squared is that each eigenvalue is little sigma squared and that is a variance. So the square is just a convention in the naming here. All right, so now we have shown that the covariance matrix of principal components is a diagonal matrix and therefore principal components are pairwise uncorrelated. Two different principal components have no correlation with each other. Next point, I have already indicated that just a step before. The PCA eigenvalues are the variances along the corresponding principal components. That just follows immediately from the last step. So the diagonals of the covariance matrix of principal components are just the eigenvalues. So those are the variances of the data along the corresponding principal components. And because the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix of the data are orthogonal to each other, they measure independent contributions of the data along these different directions. And because that is so, the individual variances of the principal components, so the eigenvalues of the principal component decomposition, measure independent contributions to the overall variance. In other words, we can just sum them up in order to account for something like a cumulative or a total variance. So the total variance of all the data equals the sum of variances along the individual principal components if we take all of them. If we take only m of them, so if we do a dimension reduction using principal component analysis, then we can sum up the cumulative variance of m such components. And the fraction of the cum cumulative variance of m components and the cumulative variance of all components, or the total variance, that is a fraction of the explained variance. So it tells us how much variance compared to the total variance do the first m components explain or contribute. So what is the explained fraction of the total variance? So that is a number between 0 and 1 and it gives us an indicator for how many components m, how many principal components m we want to keep in order to do our dimension reduction. And if the data has a low dimensional representation then often we see that with relatively few number of principal components m we get this fraction of explained variance pretty close to 1. So in other words this vm is a property that converges quickly to 1 as we increase m. And in order to have a criterion to choose m we could say we want to choose m such that our explained variance is 90 percent or 95 or 99 percent. If we choose m equals n, so if we do, do not use a dimension reduction, if we just choose all principal components, then principal component analysis is lossless. And you can simply see that by taking the projection onto all principal component vectors, so x, w, and then lifting again to the original space by multiplying with w transpose. And because w, w transpose is the identity matrix, this is again the original data. So basically principal component analysis, if you don't re remove principal components, so if you use all of them, it's just a basis transformation and it does not lose any information. You can go back to the old basis. But if you use m smaller than n principal components, so you remove some uh, principal components or you only use a few principal components to keep 
uh, whereas you throw away others, then you produce this reduced dimension data set ym equals xwm, which contains the first m principal component vectors, and this is a lossy projection. And it can be shown that this projection does not only maximize the variance of the data when projected onto the vectors w, this is what we use to derive it, but it can also be shown that it minimizes the squared reconstruction error. So the full data set that is x or x w w transposed, which is the same, the lifted projected data, so if we project onto m principal components, then we obtain x w m and we lift again with w m transposed. And now we compare those two, so we take the difference between the two and we compute the projection error by computing the Frobenius norm of this matrix here. So this is the squared reconstruction error and principal component analysis chooses W such that this squared reconstruction error is minimal. So to reiterate, maximizing the variance of the projected data and minimizing the squared reconstruction error under the constraint that the individual directions onto which we project are orthogonal, those two quantities or those two loss functions or objectives are the same. They give us the same optimal solution. Let us look at a practical application of PCA. These are digits from the MNIST data set and this is a set of numbers 3. So numbers 3 written and scanned into small pixelated images of 27 by 27 grayscale pixels. This is our, this is our data set. And now we, now we vectorize these images. So we choose a convention to turn the image matrices into vectors, for example, by just, um, by just reading them in a row-wise fashion. And then each image defines a vector in our data matrix. We compute the covariance matrix. We compute the eigenvalue decomposition of this covariance matrix. And we choose a number of eigenvectors to keep and perform a principal component analysis by projecting our data matrix onto these uh, eigenvectors that we keep. Remember that we first compute the mean vector. You see the mean vector here on the right. So the mean vector projected or written back as an image, of course, is an image again. And it's something like a mean 3. It's like the average 3 that we have in the data set. So, of course, because these data are so similar, the individual images are so similar, the mean already has a lot of information about the image. And this mean is first removed from all the images. So we are really looking at the difference images from this mean uh, representation of, the, of all the images. And then we perform principal component analysis with the remaining data set. Now in the bottom right, you see, except for the mean, also the eigenvectors, uh, the first, second, and third eigenvector of the principal component analysis. So those are the eigenvectors of the covariance matrix of the data, again visualized as an image. And black and white here are, let's say, positive and negative components of the eigenvector, or negative and positive. The order doesn't really matter because every eigenvector stays an eigenvector if we multiply it with a constant, such as minus 1. But so what is interesting are the differences. So, so which pixels are black and which pixels are white. And this tells us what is the kind of motion or change with respect to the mean that is represented by this eigenvector. And you can see here that the eigenvector 1 is essentially a rotation around the mean. So it's like turning the number 3 left and right. The eigenvector 2 is shifting a little bit left and right, the eigenvector 3 is shifting a little bit up and down, etc. The higher eigenvector, the higher eigenvectors will typically 
correspond to more localized or smaller changes of the image, like uh, making uh, one part of the number three shorter or longer, or turning it a little bit. So you can think of these eigenvectors as directions that represent local or more global changes of your object. In the top right, now you see the representation of a single image, so one of these number three images, reconstructed with a different number of eigenvectors. So this is uh, the, the first is the reconstruction with two eigenvectors. So that means the mean itself and two additional eigenvectors. Then 10 eigenvectors, 100 eigenvectors, 500 eigenvectors. And what you see here that with 500 eigenvectors you basically see no difference to the original image. But of course 500 eigenvectors is a very large number. Uh, this, is, this is almost a complete set of all dimensions. Whereas with two 10 and 100 dimensions you can still see it's a 3, but you can also see that's a 3 already by looking at the mean. And, and this is um, refined by adding more and more eigenvectors, but the overall image looks a little bit fuzzy or smoothed out. And this is because the eigenvectors with small eigenvalues, so those that you tend to throw away in principal component analysis, correspond to, to small or localized changes. And this is natural because principal component analysis tries to maximize the variance of the projected data. So everything that cont contributes little to the variance is rather thrown away in principal component analysis. So you lose details, small details, you lose sharpness, and you tend to get smoothed images. Now let's look at another data set. This is a data set of small images of faces, 19 by 19 pixels. So these are really small images, and there are about 2,500 of them. And it turns out that you get a pretty good reconstruction with only three components. So here it's very interesting to look at the eigenvectors of the principal component decomposition, also known as eigenfaces. And so these are faces or images of faces that are oriented. So the face, the, the person uh, whose photo is taken is basically uh, centered in the image and the person is looking more or less straight to the camera. So the faces are relatively similarly oriented. So it's meaning to talk about something as a mean face that is like the mean position of eyes, nose and mouth. And then the first couple of eigenvectors can be thought as, of as relatively global changes to these faces, such as um, turning and moving the faces a little bit, uh, um, shrinking or growing the nose, adding a smile, removing a smile, etc. And then only in later eigenvectors you get more local and also asymmetric changes to the faces. And so it's, it's really interesting to see these eigenfaces here. Of course, none of these eigenvectors are actual faces uh, that correspond to any data points in the input data, but together they represent the basis that can be used to span the faces at the input data. So with this I want to wrap up the principal component analysis section and now go to the next step, namely autoencoders. So now we will use what we have learned in principal component analysis and design a deep learning architecture using the loss functions we have seen here.